Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for the introductions. Um, I'm acutely aware that this is the third day of this amazing conference, and we are all probably very tired. Um, so thinking about this and knowing about the schedule, I thought that I would suggest perhaps a somewhat different dynamic uh, for this keynote speech. And as I do visual culture, I'm going to use a lot of images. Um, and I hope that's just going to be some eye candy for your tired eyes, but also a bit of ideas uh, um, about the conservative turn. Um, I'm, going to I'm going to start by taking us to the beginning of the conversation. Oops, that's not really the beginning. Uh, that's exactly the end of it. Um, um, I need to work out how the keyboard works here. Uh, so when announcing the conference on Wednesday, it was, right? Uh, Sana actually positioned two important questions in my view. She asked about the place of culture in Russia. Um, and then later in sort of informal conversations, we talked about how it was perhaps incorrect sometimes to misplace the adjective and to say Russian culture. Uh, another, or the other question that she asked in her opening statement was uh, about research methods that we can apply to the study of that problem of um, uh, the location of Russian culture. So I'm going to start by thinking about that a little bit and then I'll present uh, some new stuff from my research. So it's actually not going to be from the film book or any other one, it's something entirely new. And I gathered this research, did this research over the summer um, in the Russian Federation and I hope this is gonna become kind of part of a bigger project and I'll be hugely grateful for your feedback. Um, so, uh, when I hear the words sort of place or location of culture, I can't help thinking about the famous uh, book by Homi Baba, The Location of Culture of 1991, in which he suggested sort of rethinking questions of identity, social agency, and national affiliation. Uh, if you recall the book, it's all about sort of the issues of hybridization and challenging our kind of essential assumptions about different parts of the world. Um, a critique of Eurocentrism, etc., etc. Uh, what is problematic, though, about his book is that her, he actually critiques representation from the point of view of representation. So he goes back to where he kind of begins. And the other item on the agenda that he's been criticised for is the fact that he separates theory and politics. So these are two kind of big ideas that I want to work with uh, and to suggest ways in which we can overcome uh, uh, those challenges. And in order to do that, I want to kind of draw our attention to the opportunities provided by theories of uh, non-representational theories overall. Um, it's a group of scholars, and this is just a, a very short list of um, uh, sort of authors who work in this area, um, but they really suggest a kind of a dynamic of discussions that have been going on for the past um, um, two decades, really. Uh, I'm going to draw your attention to this particular quote from Lorimer in which he discusses uh, sort of the position of the researcher in relation to their object of study. And he asks us to draw our attention to, and I'm citing here, shared experiences, everyday routines, fleeting encounters, embodied movements, precognitive triggers, practical skills, affective intensity, enduring urges, unexceptional interactions, and sensuous dispositions. Now, this all sounds quite obscure, and there's always a problem of how we translate this into everyday practice and how we can use that for our kind of thinking. So I'm going to kind of try to show what I've been doing using that sort of idea of working with cultural material that would be beyond presentation or outside presentation or challenging presentation. What sort of information can we kind of harvest from this experience? And also, how can we conceptualize it? So these are kind of bigger concerns for myself. I'm not entirely sure I've got the answers to those questions, but at least I, I want to kind of um, um, move on with that. Um, if, if I were to summarize sort of the, the, the key um, principles of this non-representational agenda, I would probably boil down them to just five. Um, the first is that the world in which we work is made through performative practice. Um, the second one is that the world in which we work or live is always in the making, that it's never finite. It's always kind of in the process of evolving. This world is also effective. Um, 
but here I want to kind of distance myself and, 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 and say that I'm not really trying to suggest a new kind of way of thinking about emotions or effects, but rather I want to see how we can position ourselves as effective bodies to the body of culture that we want to investigate. Um, there's also a claim made that the world is not human, that there are other things that are beyond text that we can kind of engage with and work with and consider, um, and that uh, the, the world and the type of thinking that is being presented to us is that of experience, it's kind of exper experiential world. And where I want to take that sort of philosophically is the concept of the event. What constitutes an event in a particular practice? Do we care about its size, its impact, its observation techniques, etc.? Uh, moving on from uh, this part of the kind of theoret theoretical grounding for my talk, I want to remind ourselves of a particular text by Sergei Oshakin, um, his book Patriotism of Despair. And actually, I want to refer to, again, a particular event um, at the University of Cambridge when he gave a talk uh, uh, examining uh, the streets of Russia in the 1990s. So he used a lot of images, similar to the one that you see right now, where we see this uneven surfaces on Russian roads. So there are steps, they use different types of tiles and pavement. And he interpreted this sort of situation as a kind of a site of trauma of loss of uh, uh, the Soviet Union, of uh, the loss uh, or the trauma of the Second World War. And he really talked about the kind of the urban environment as a place where that trauma is being played out and it emerges as a monument, but also a stage at the same time. Well, I'd like to take it further and suggest that perhaps what we are really looking here is a kind of a, a palimpsest where we can read different texts co-emerging um, and, and, and kind of overlapping. And I'm wondering how we can refer to that particular uh, context, uh, the, to this sort of floor, which I'm going to claim, to me at least, is a type of a screen on which we can project our emotions, our experiences, our being. Um, so I got interested in a particular cultural activity, uh, which in Russian is called Reklamo na asfaltie. Uh, which translates into English uh, sort of as floor graphics, floor sticker ads or stencil ads. They're actually very different things um, in English and, and those practices are used all over the world. One of the, uh, one of the most familiar uh, uses of that is when you are in an airport and you see sort of lines drawn on the floor and they direct you to the place where you're supposed to pick up your luggage. Um, so there's this sort of practice and I was thinking sort of what I can do about it. Um, um, before I move on to my kind of case study, I want to draw your attention to the direction of the gaze in this experience, right? Um, when you're walking in the street and you're looking down and you're kind of observing those ads, you are actually looking down. As opposed to, for example, a Soviet citizen who would be working in the streets of Leningrad and always looking up because all the slogans, all the posters would be positioned above their heads. And I have a, um, an idea for this reason. I think the connection has to do with the use of mobile phones, because as we walk around with our smartphones, we are looking down, so it is very effective in that sense. Um, but I also want to interpret this as a kind of a political statement, and that's where I'm going to kind of the title of my talk, Cultures Politics, because by looking down, we kind of also activate a particular political attitude to the events that are around us. And as somebody, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but somebody said uh, at one of the panels uh, at this conference, sometimes we choose not to look at things, right? Um, so we can be looking down. Um, these are examples of the type of advertising I want to talk about. Um, some of them are sort of very basic. So this one, for example, advertises hair extensions. This one is about uh, a new hostel that appeared in St. Petersburg, etc. So if we categorize this sort of inscriptions on the floor, um, the palimpsest that I mentioned before, I would probably suggest that we should label them as guerrilla marketing. And there's, an, uh, there's a study called guerrilla advertising that goes back to the 1980s and the kind of a punk movement and particular opposition to mainstream bourgeois culture of the period. What I also want to say here is that guerrilla advertising appeared in the West as a reaction to austerity politics of that period, and I think we see a similar trajectory in the Russian context as well. 
Um, because we know that they first appeared in Moscow in 2009, but became particularly popular in St. Petersburg. I don't really know why, but we can kind of speculate about this. So as I just mentioned before, uh, it is a case of this austerity aesthetic that has become so prominent um, in St. Petersburg and elsewhere. Uh, but to me, that practice also indicates what I call unregulated economic activity because those images appear on the ground at places where there is a lot of economic activity going on, for example, metro stations or markets, etc., etc. So by looking at them, we can actually map that social interaction that takes place in particular areas in Russian towns. Um, this actually is a legal activity, and this is a screen grab of a company in St. Petersburg that offers, actually, this sort of advertising to um, uh, businesses, individuals, you name it. One of the kind of sweetest examples I saw is someone actually posting a message to their beloved on the floor and sort of saying that they're going to organize a party, etc. I don't know how that ended, but I thought that was uh, interesting there. Um, this screen grab shows the type of advertising they offer in St. Petersburg. So you can have um, sort of your basic, standard and premium versions of this sort of guerrilla advertising and they differ in terms of colour, use of font, etc. What I find very important for our consideration here is that on this website there's already a discussion about the legality of this activity. Okay? Um, and this sort of, there is a, there's a whole kind of discourse about it, whether it is legal or not. What do I see here? Um, the first is that uh, there is a kind of acute awareness of the boundaries of the allowed that to me are very new uh, in the Russian Federation. And to me that is part of this conservative turn is appreciation of those boundaries, whether they're related to social practice, economic activity, or any other activity whatsoever. What's also interesting is that this activity actually is a result of a loophole in Russian legislation because it regulates all sorts of advertising, but not the one on the floor. There were a few attempts to regulate it, but they were not successful. So there is a kind of hybridization of different ages in the society, lawyers, entrepreneurs, social activists, you name it, that participate in this form of um, um, activity. Uh, this is just sort of a summary of what I was saying. Um, and uh, uh, there is always a danger of being fined, actually, for, do, for, for, for posting those uh, images on the floor because the police may treat them as vandalism. So a lot of those images are actually being stenciled on the floor at night, um, uh, which also kind of interests me as a site of work, right, of labour, perhaps by immigrant communities who are happy to work at night, sort of dangerous times, etc., and that goes, again, unregulated. I want to go back to, to my sample and draw your attention to another sort of image that I did not comment on. It's upside down and it says Oddech, relaxation. And I think it's very suggestive of what kind of relaxation it offers. Um, as, as there was a panel now on biopolitics, I think we can kind of talk productively about the use of uh, biopolitics in this regard. And I would probably call this kind of con stencil conservatism, although as a practice, it ironically goes back to the practice of Russian avant-garde of the 1920s. And the same use of kind of posters uh, for the purpose of regulating uh, the relationship between different subjects uh, in their social or sexual activity as such. So for my kind of in-depth analysis, I'm going to take you to the beautiful city of St. Petersburg, and all images are mine except a few that I kind of posted as, um, as belonging to other authors. So there was um, an occurrence that I observed, and I'm going to comment on that, which took place in this part of St. Petersburg on the Vasilyevsky uh, uh, Island, uh, not far from the uh, Merit, uh, Merit Hotel. This is how the area looks from outside. Uh, so it's actually quite away from where tourists hang out, uh, but at the same time, there are a lot of Westerners who kind of pass by, because as you can imagine, um, um, a, a lot of American tourists go and, and stay in Marriott. Um, I want you to pay attention to this big billboard over here that you can see there, which uh, actually advertises, I'm sorry it's quite small, but it advertises two things at the same time. It's, an, it's a new hotel but it's also um, a sun, 
uh, kind of a, a salon where you can go and get your beautiful suntan. Um, so this sort of representation is regulated by the state. Um, so it went through, we may call censorship, as regards normative sexual activity. Um, and as you can see here, it does suggest, you know, particularly striking masculine and feminine identities. Uh, so it's been kind of okayed by the existing um, 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 governments. Um, so what happened to me is that uh, one day I was walking towards Merritt, because that's where I was staying, um, and I saw a man in the street. And that man was sort of kind of my age, and he was dressed very well. He had this sort of, what, what kind of drew my attention, because uh, uh, I hadn't seen that for a while, is that his, his trousers were ironed very carefully. Um, he had a backpack, and he had these cans of spray. So he was spraying something on the floor. So I thought, how exciting, I want to see what he's putting up there. So when I approached him, what I actually saw, that he was not spraying a new stencil on the floor, he was actually covering it up. He was deleting it. And I got really interested in that and asked him, so what are you doing? He looked at me judgmentally, kind of like scanning me up and down, and he literally said, you will not understand what I'm doing. And I said, well, do you want to try me? Maybe, maybe I can understand what you're doing. And then he said, well, if you do understand, there's a shop across the road that sells those spray cans. Why don't you go buy one and start doing what I'm doing? I'm going to unpack this incident, and that's going to be precisely that sort of you know, long and windy definition of what non-representational theorists do, because I'm interested in that occurrence. Um, what he was doing, actually, he was deleting the telephone number on uh, that sign. Now, I did not take a picture of that man because my university does not allow me to take images of individuals. Um, and I saw a lot of those actually sprayed over signs all over the area where I was staying. I think I've got another one. So, sauna, uh, Lubov, 24 hours, these are all references to different sexual activities. So my question is, on whose behalf was he acting? Was he there to represent the, the government of Vladimir Putin, that he wanted to disable this sort of activity? Or is there some kind of a grass, grassroots level kind of reaction to what's going on and what he was doing? So I'm going to try to answer these questions by looking at the wider context of urban life in St. Petersburg, but also travel elsewhere with you and see how we can think about that um, um, creatively, perhaps. Um, one thing that struck me immediately is that two months after I witnessed that event, there was obviously an attack on the Manej Museum in Moscow, where a, a religious group, uh, as you know, smashed some uh, artifacts. And to me, that was a kind of a similar process of defacing, of iconoclasm that I witnessed um, uh, in St. Petersburg, to the point that I actually believe that that man that I saw represented a particular church, particular faith, that was kind of interested in that. You're shaking your head, no, perhaps no, I don't know. This is me kind of speculating, trying to react to that. But what I did see there is this process of inscribing and deleting, inscribing and deleting that takes place all over St. Petersburg. So when I think about it, I can't help remembering that uh, at the moment, Russian government is famous for setting up new legislation all the time and then repealing it, right? Uh, a scholar, Karin uh, Gazarian, actually tells us that up to 30% of news generated uh, in Russia is the news about different agencies repealing their own news. So they announce, for example, that they're going to increase the pension, uh, the retirement age for Russian pensioners. And then three weeks into it, they actually repeal it. And that way they generate this sort of ongoing inscribing and deleting process, which obviously causes a lot of stress uh, uh, to, to el elderly people. Um, it also refers to this legislation about the use of the Russian language, because as you know, you were not supposed to use four words, and I'm not going to use them. And if you've been to Russia recently, you've noticed perhaps that uh, it's very rare that we find those words written anywhere where they used to be. So that is the process of deleting. But at the same time, we have ads like this one, uh, where they advertise a film called Fuck Up. 
Uh, so that is a process of reinscribing of the same kind of process, but using a different language. So I'm, I'm using these examples to kind of uh, emphasize that the debates are taking place, but perhaps in areas that we overlook in our research. Um, I would probably also call it uh, uh, graffiti conservatism, um, because that practice of spontaneous decoration of urban spaces is used for very kind of, you know, clear patriotic or nationalistic stance. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So this car, uh, I saw it um, uh, in Veronese during the 9th of May celebrations, um, where people would actually decorate their cars uh, uh, using sort of the symbols and, and, and insignia of, of the period. I just want you to contrast uh, what we see on the wall there with the car itself and the kind of different dynamic that that suggests as a kind of, again, uh, to use my earlier term, palimpsest of patriotism as such, where we love our country in the same way we love a woman, as that, that part of it says. Or perhaps more disturbingly, we actually see that elements of combining messages um, where in places where we don't expect this. Uh, you may know that this is one of those stations where you can make payments or um, uh, you can transfer money, so you can pay for your gas and electricity, but you can also support an unknown patriotic organization over there. You can make a donation to, um, I don't know who they are really and who they represent. I imagine this is actually an economic business activity where people just collect money using this patriotic sentiment around the time of celebration. If I want to go back to this experience that I had in um, St. Petersburg, I want to say that what is at play there is conservative chauvinism. If you recall from the images of, of that graffiti on the floor, the man was not defacing the actual service, as in sex. He was not def defacing the words love or sauna. What he actually was deleting uh, was the telephone number. What I want to draw our attention here is that the person was not concerned with the actual life or future of the women or men involved in that sex trade and that sex exploitation. That was not on the agenda. What was on the agenda is to get rid of the visibility of that practice and kind of breaking into the communication pattern by uh, defacing the telephone number. Well, luckily, there are other areas in St. Petersburg where you can see a very different type of graffiti. So if we just go to the other side of town, um, and we, I'm talking about July 2015, we can see, for example, this uh, uh, fantastic example of graffiti art uh, by Adela Jusic, uh, which kind of questions uh, the role of women uh, and kind of the attitudes to women in a capitalist society. And I've got another slide which is, um, uh, kind of speaks for itself, where it says that capitalism is challenged by vagina and clitoris. And when you see that, you start wondering, well, how did that go through the kind of the existing uh, uh, network of censorship? How possible is this sort of representation in the Russian Federation at the moment? The answer that I would want to suggest here is that there are different zones for different cultural activities. So while sex is being offered outside Merritt Hotel, you can then have a political critique of sexism um, in uh, Project Loft Etagé, and that's precisely where that exhibition took place. Um, if I want to consider that incident um, uh, outside Merritt in a different dynamic, I would suggest that what we have here is I call pop-up conservatism. Um, if you walk uh, along the streets of Helsinki, you will notice how they are uh, sort of uh, branding new pop-up stores. Even, there's even a pop-up hotel in, in Helsinki now. Uh, which is, I think is a kind of taking it too far, because if it's a hotel, it's permanent, right? It doesn't just pop up and then disappear. Um, but what matters to me here is the fact that there is no pattern for this sort of uh, uh, conservative events to exist, that they happen in very unpredicted, kind of fluent environments uh, that are very hard to register and follow. Um, for example, uh, there are also pop-up kiosks that sell patriotic t-shirts. Um, and uh, I'm using this image to kind of illustrate how that patriotic sentiment is combined with just leisure lifestyle activity of loving coffee, because that's also a pop-up coffee shop with that little kind of a, a van that sells coffee that comes out on the city square, and you can enjoy both the coffee and some t-shirts. 
um, that are actually very, very expensive. As you can see there, you will pay about um, um, you know, 1,500 rubles for that. Uh, now, looking at this particular image, again, I want to talk about the places, the location of culture and conservatives there. If you look up at the, uh, the top part of his, you will see how much reference there is to new media, and that's what Yelena Vartanova talked about today. It's kind of omnipresent. It suggests mediatization of uh, uh, Russian culture and culture in Russia. At the same time, um, this T-shirt is something that we wear close to our skin, so this is a kind of a, a, an example of biopolitics at play. Another way of thinking about this event is to kind of consider it in terms of other environments, and I would probably define this type of thinking as um, convergent conservatism. I'm going to suggest yet another event that was going on uh, in St. Petersburg at exactly the same time, and there was an exhibition of uh, photography um, in the central touristy part of that town. It was called The Country of Victory, The Victory of the Country, just to emphasize we're talking not about May 2015, but July 2015. It was actually a serious photograph set up along the street of uh, St. Petersburg, which celebrated uh, Russian athletes and their victory in the Olympic Games. But a clear parallel was drawn between the Olympic Games in Sochi and the victory of the Russian Federation and their team effort with that of uh, uh, the Second World War. If we consider the actual images, that's another view of, of, uh, of the exhibition, is they present to us this sort of uh, very handsome models, right? Uh, the fact that the photographs are black and white are suggestive of the photography of the wartime, again, using the reels of, from the war period. It's a stylization of, uh, of that type which offers no compromise because there's no other option but to win. Uh, that's what I think the, this exhibition suggests. It also has this very um, uh, granular quality to the photographs to the extent that we have this sense of raw masculinity. And I imagine you will not be surprised if I suggest that one of the uh, fantastic athletes of the time was Vladimir Putin. Um, Another part of my um, thinking about this event was uh, as regards whether that person had to do anything with the state or not, whether they were kind of acting on their own accord. But clearly, we can kind of talk about conservatism as co-option. And right now, I'm going to take you now to the capital, to Moscow, and uh, talk about an exhibition that was out there. It was called in Russian Mujestva and very hard to translate into English uh, because whether that should be courage, virility or just manhood, I'm not really sure. Um, it is by Mikhail Rosanov. Those who are in the know would appreciate that this is somebody who started as an avant-garde artist in the 1990s but now is responsible for the creation of photo albums of the Moscow government and actually works with uh, the state directly. So this is the space at Vinzavod uh, in Moscow where you can see on display those big uh, kind of photographic uh, uh, tableaus set around. I want to draw your attention to the fact that I was the only person actually enjoying this exhibition. That was just a regular Friday afternoon, but that's how much interest that drew. Uh, they were beautiful photographs of Russian landscape, again, very granular, black and white, suggesting that sort of aesthetic that I already described to you in relation to the previous exhibition. And there's another kind of panoramic view to enjoy here. Now, as you learn eventually, these are actually contemporary photographs of the sites of uh, main battles of the Second World War, like uh, uh, Stalingrad battle. So again, this reminds me of uh, Sana's question about the location of culture, whether that location is in the memory of the people who think about the events of the war, or in fact, we can kind of branch out and go into the actual world and enjoy those places. Um, what is interesting is that these photographs were commissioned actually by the Historic Society of the Russian Federation, headed by uh, uh, Mr. Medinsky. So they are kind of a direct product of collaboration between the artist and uh, the cultural uh, ministry. And as you can see here, this is what normally appears as a kind of a curatorial description of an image. Instead, but now, instead of actually saying that this is a photograph, that the size of it is two by two meters, whatever, it actually gives you details about the battle itself and how many people died on which side. 
which clearly suggests this very binary dynamic, again, of deleting, of inscribing, of seeing the world in black and white. And to me, that's an element of uh, Russian conservatism at the moment. Uh, while being in Moscow, I couldn't help thinking about new developments um, in that town, and one of them again would be familiar to me. This is not my photograph, this is a Fisher photograph of the development along the Moscow River, uh, along the kind of um, uh, the center for art out there. I want us to have a look at this new embankment. Um, going back to Shakin's idea about the site of trauma, in this case, that site of trauma has been entirely replaced. Uh, with a new site of celebration, where there are no more holes on the road, the same pavement is used, it's marked very clearly, uh, it is a kind of a new modern world, I thought. But walking along the street, I couldn't help thinking that I actually want to go in a straight line, but this path is taking me sideways. As you can see here, it's a kind of a curvy, wavy road out there that you cannot cross, but actually follow along it. And what happens in the process is that you slow down. And I think that what we happen in case with Russia is not demodernization, but rather slowing down and kind of observing what is around. And this is a panoramic view of an area outside the Garage uh, 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 Cultural Center, where I think that process of slowing down is particularly evident. This reminded me of the Russian government's constant play with time. Uh, because in the past two, three years, uh, uh, Russia shifted its time zones a dozen times. Every time I call Russia, I have to check what time they're out there, because I'm confused myself, because I travel quite a lot, but also their time travels. Um, uh, and they change the number of uh, time zones, etc. So it's the same kind of bigger scale event of slowing down events, of slowing down that modernity uh, that we represent. If you enter the Garage exhibition, as I did in July 2015, you become part of the opening huge exhibition, the, the title of which was Contemporaneity, Modernity. And I was interested in thinking about how the curators of this exhibition, who obviously represent Abramovich and the, the economic and political elite of the country, how they conceptualized modernity in that regard. And I couldn't help thinking that the main message of that exhibition was that of play. Uh, that was on the top floor, that was the main piece of art that you would see as you walk in. Uh, it is actually by a Thai, Thai artist, uh, and it, it is a kind of a set of uh, interactions that you would have. You were supposed to play ping pong, as people did, um, trying to answer the question of what is tomorrow? That is the question. And the answer that the audience gave, the participants gave to this question was that tomorrow is a game, that it is something that we can play with, uh, and to me that is a sign of that Russian conservatism. I'm now going to switch to a video and show you another kind of very disturbing example of that gamification of discourse in Russia. Just bear with me, I hope that my YouTube video is going to play. Uh, you may be familiar with this video. In this video, we will see Dmitry Kisilov talking about the dangers of contemporary world, and then the video is going to show us how that eventual address was actually made. So just let's just enjoy it. Uh, it's, a, it's a kind of a fan video, that's not me commenting it.
as this fan video suggests, um, Russian Propaganda Channel 1 is actually structured directly on examples taken from Hollywood. And again, I want to interpret this as this kind of ongoing process of inscribing and deleting, on kind of negotiating discourses of gamification of politics in Russia and also displacing it because it actually does not appear as Russian anymore. It appears more that of the American politics or rather it's kind of Hollywood interpretation. Now I'm going to uh, now do my kind of a final interpretation of the event uh, of that occurrence in St. Petersburg and I really want to kind of focus on the notion of globality that is very important here. So the event of that man defacing sort of some uh, graffiti advertising on the floor was not just local. In my view, it was also global. And not because there might have been some Western tourists walking around, but because it kind of aspired to that global visibility. And I'm going to kind of explain how that worked using a very different example, which is very, different, uh, very recent. It actually happened in August and September this year. Uh, some of you may be kind of familiar with that, uh, uh, but not all, so I'm going to explain what that is. Let me just go back to my PowerPoint here. Um, I called it vampire conservatism, and number 13 is for a reason, of course, I'm very proud of that. Uh, it makes a reference to Viktor Pilevin's novel, of course, because I was not sure whether to say a vampire or cannibalization, but I think both work. Uh, it's about appropriating the sentiment among people uh, for political purpose that is done through the means of popular culture in a way that is then repackaged and sold back to the people in such a way that they feel that they belong to that new kind of geopolitical vision that is given to us uh, uh, um, by, uh, by the government. So it's a, it's a thing called Look Luchok, Little Onion. Uh, so there was a program on Channel One, again, very important, Vicherny uh, Urgant. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a TV show that is uh, a, a, a format borrowed from the US television in which uh, this young journalist traveled to Russian provinces and she traveled to a town called Luk where they had a festival of onions, Luk, so there's a kind of a play of those two. And there she came across this man um, uh, on, on your right uh, that she started interviewing and as she was doing it he actually came up with a song. He spontaneously started singing and he started composing lyrics with that song. To me that is important because it takes me again back to my kind of experience where that process was spontaneous. Somebody was actually defacing those, that graffiti on the floor in an unregulated, totally improvised way. What happens afterwards is that Russian singers appropriate that song, that lyrics, and they actually turn this into a musical spectacle. And see, here we see a singer Valeria performing that same song, uh, which is definitely very sweet, except we should remember that she also supported uh, Russian involvement in, uh, in Eastern Ukraine. So it's a very kind of straightforward political move. I'm going to show you the clip at the very end of my uh, talk to just kind of um, um, conclude on a funny note a little bit. But I want to talk about what actually happens in the clip that you will see. Um, uh, the, the, the video actually focuses quite a lot on the uh, performers being kind of behind that glass all, with, all the time and then this director directing and it's not always clear who that person is. To me that is not a recognizable figure. Um, eventually after Valeria sings the song and other singers sing the song we have this group of unknown performers, perhaps students, who kind of come in unison and they perform this song. Now, I interviewed people who work on radio and they told me that since this song emerged, it has been the most popular music performance on Russian radio ever. That people ring in and ask to, for them to play the song all the time. And their interpretation is that this is the moment when all Russian nation came together in celebration of its own unity and identity. That's why I call it vampiric uh, uh, conservatism. Because it appropriates that uh, sentiment of people. And what it does here, it kind of really harvests the, the notion of authenticity. Because that man, Alia Kaparian, is an authentic person who actually performed on camera for the first time in his life. And in the video you will see that, how kind of truthful he is in his actions. But almost immediately that was taken over by the official discourse. What is 
particularly striking about our video is that towards the end of it, they actually included images taken from some other video that I have not identified yet, but I kind of am interested in what that is. Have a look at that. It actually shows uh, uh, most likely American performers um, uh, singing some kind of a song in the US, but they actually cut that sequence and put it into the music clip made in Russia, local chalk. And it appears as if common Americans are singing together with the Russians in their search for authenticity. This is a close-up so that there's no mistake. Almost immediately, I thought of that. This really reminds me of something, of the times, actually, of Cold War, because we had uh, this fantastic song by Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, We Are the World, We Are the Children, that you would remember, where, again, all nations of the world come together in their desire to help people living in Africa. So I'm going to conclude with this quite disturbing thought of that what I saw in this vampiric conservatism is a return to this notion of treating their own people as if they're in need of help, of kind of assisting them, of being incapable of living by themselves. So I'm, I'm going to show uh, you the clip um, um, sort of as I finish, but before I, I show the clip, I just want to kind of summarize uh, my key ideas here. So just to say that uh, by using this non-representational theories, I try to think about conservatism as a particular regime of visibility, where that visibility is a spatial practice, where the floor in St. Petersburg is also a screen on which we project, on which we write. It is that sort of display of a particular sentiment. It is an effective event that really talks to our connection to the world that we occupy. I could keep on walking, or I could stop and actually talk to the man, and that's what I chose to do. That was my kind of effective reaction to it. It is clearly an attempt to reappropriate urban space, to control it in new ways. But what is important is that it's a gesture, that that man uh, defacing insignia on the floor suggested to me a kind of a particular performative sentiment of conservatism of being ashamed of what's written on the floor and not desiring this for continuing. They used guerrilla tactics, like they did during the protests of 2011-2013. Uh, uh, it's kind of guerrilla movement out there of people who uh, represent that conservative uh, uh, trend. And what is very important is that it was an individual action, that I didn't see a group of people doing that, but rather it was down to a particular individual. And to me, this is also kind of a struggle for attention in uh, the kind of symbolic uh, economy of the Russian Federation. Um, it also takes me to another kind of level of thinking here, and that is what Yelena Vartanova talked about this morning, and that is the move from use of media in an open space to actually mediatization of that urban space, which is a different kind of reality of being all together. And finally, by alluding to the uh, uh, music clip we, about Little Onion, what I want to say here, there's a kind of a desire for global visibility, except the world doesn't know about it, but in fact the producers of that music video, they imagine that the world does. So I would probably call uh, this a kind of a selfie era when we're looking at ourselves, we're absorbed in ourselves, we're not looking beyond the boundaries of subjectivity. And to conclude, because I think I have like two minutes, right? I'm actually going to show you a uh, part of that clip to enjoy, if you like that kind of stuff. I'm going to skip sections of it so you can see kind of most of it uh, and appreciate how that was done. So this is organed starting the performance and this sort of setting of intimacy of a kind of a Soviet kitchen style when you are just playing the guitar. Um, needless to say, the, 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 the choice of classical instruments is kind of striking here.
Just think about that Robocop video that I showed before. Thank you very much.